Instagram.com. Could smartwatch technology save your life? We're going to talk about it right now. Smartwatches have been around for a long time, but some of the newer ones have a feature on it called ECG, or electrocardiogram. This feature allows your watch to monitor the electrical pulses that are given off from your heart. We're going to talk more about how that works, but here's a great article that summarizes the newest and best smart watches and their ECG abilities. We'll put a link in the description below. Now, I'm not sponsored by any of these watches, and so I'll be free to sort of talk about them right now. So an ECG is something that you might get in a doctor's office or an emergency room, and it's a way that a clinician can look in many different ways at your heart and how it's beating based on the electrical conduction that's going down its conduction fibers. So what is an ECG? It's basically a photograph of how electricity is moving through the heart from many different angles all at the same time. And this can be tremendously helpful in diagnosing very common heart ailments. Today, we're going to talk about one of those, which is atrial fibrillation. This is what's known as a 12-lead EKG, and as you can see here, there's 1, 2, 3, times 1, 2, 3, 4 different leads. These are looking at the heart from different angles. Lead 2 is reproduced at the bottom all across the bottom of the page because sometimes we like to see a full 10 seconds of a particular rhythm. And since lead 2 looks at the right atrium, which is where the rhythm is generated, that's why we usually have lead 2 going across the bottom. The type of lead that you see in a watch is limited to just one of these leads. In fact, it's this one right here called lead 1. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So what you're seeing here looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, we have that red arrow that's going from the right arm to the left arm. It's got a specific viewpoint of the electrical conduction in the heart, as you can see here by Roman numeral one, and what that looks like on the ECG. And if we look at it from different aspects here on the second one, we can see it going from the right arm down to the left foot, and that's lead number two, as you can see there. And it looks slightly different because we're looking at it at a slightly different angle. An additional lead here on the right is lead three, and you can see it's going from the left arm down to the left foot. And that again has a slightly different unique look there as well. And as we keep going here along the bottom, AVF, AVL, AVR, those are again different looks at the electrical conduction there as well. So AVF is looking from the heart straight down to the left foot. AVL is looking at the center of the body out to the left arm. And AVR is looking at the center of the body out to the right arm. And of course, these are the views that you get on a 12-lead ECG. Because you're putting your two hands together on a watch, however, you're pretty much going to be limited to what you see here in lead Roman numeral 1 in the upper left-hand corner. And as you can see here, when somebody is wearing the watch, in this case on the left hand, the back of the watch is picking up the electrical signals from the left hand. And what the watch is constructed and engineered to do is when the person touches their right hand to the crown of the watch, as it's called, then the watch is able to get the electrical signal from the right hand. And as you can see there, it's generating an ECG rhythm in lead one. And again, that's where we compare the electrical conduction from the right arm going over to the left arm. And that's picked up here in the watch because the watch is touching the left arm. And as soon as you touch the crown of that watch there where the knobs are with the right finger, that connects the electrical circuit and the watch is able to generate a single lead ECG, in this case, lead one. Okay, great. So why would you want to have an ECG? on your watch. Well, today we're gonna to talk about just one of the conditions that this type of a device can pick up and why it's important to detect it early for the prevention of stroke. So let's talk about the heart a little bit here. This is the view of the heart looking from in front. So this is gonna be the right side of the heart and this is gonna be the left side of the heart. So blood that is lacking in oxygen comes back to this chamber known as the right atrium and it goes through this tricuspid valve and then goes into the right ventricle. The right ventricle, which is a somewhat muscular chamber, pumps it out through the pulmonary valve to the lungs. And there it picks up oxygen and comes back 
to the left atrium, passes then through the mitral valve into the very muscular left ventricle, and then passes through the aortic valve into the aorta and onto the rest of the body. Now, it's important to understand that these atria are exactly as they sound. As Roman architecture will tell you, the atria is a holding place, and that's why these were named as atria, because they simply hold the blood. And then what they do in the cardiac conduction cycle is that both the right and the left atrium will contract, generally speaking, at the same time, pushing the blood that is held in the atrium down into these ventricles. And that happens a split second before the ventricles themselves contract. And so what we see here is contraction of the atria, pushing the blood into the ventricles, the ventricles enlarging, allowing more blood in the ventricles right before the ventricles themselves contract and push blood out simultaneously into the respective chambers. Now, how that would look electrically is something similar to this. So first is there's going to be something called a pacemaker. And by pacemaker, what I'm saying is your body's own natural pacemaker. These things have intrinsic rhythms in them, and they set the pace for your heart. And the pacemaker is known as the sinal atrial node, and it sends off the signal first, and it goes down these highly specialized muscular cells that are part of the atria. And then there's contraction. So contraction occurs in the right atrium and spreads over to the left atria, and that appears as a small deflection of electricity when you're looking at the ECG, and that's known as the P wave. Then what happens is the electrical conduction goes generally in this direction, and it will meet up here in the center of the heart, and that's known as the AV node. And something special happens in the AV node, and that is the conduction slows down. Now, because electrical conduction happens much faster than the pushing of blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle, it has to be slowed down, otherwise the electrical conduction would come down very quickly into the ventricles, and they would basically contract at the same time as the atria. We don't want that. We want the atria to contract first, let all the blood or as much of it as possible come down in the RV, and then have the RV and the LV contract afterwards. That's why the electricity is held up here at the AV node. There's a pause that occurs. As that wave of electricity goes here to the AV node, the relaxation of the atria occur, and that's known as repolarization. That is a very small amount of electrical activity. It's almost undetectable on an ECG that we're showing here. Once things get held up here in the AV node, eventually they get conducted down into these specialized muscle cells called the Hisperkinji system, and then it goes around and causes contraction of the left ventricle. That's known as the QRS complex. So there's a Q, there's an R, and there's an S complex. And why do we call it Q, R, and S? These are simply letters that have been assigned to these points on the ECG, and the complex is simply referring to the pattern that is made when you put all of those letters together. So in this case, that spike would be the QRS complex. And this very large electrical conduction occurs, and that is the ventricle contracting. So here at the P wave, we have the atria contracting, and here at the QRS, we have the very large and bulky ventricles contracting. And when the ventricles relax, this is known as repolarization, and it manifests itself as the T wave. And as opposed to the atria, when they repolarize, you can't see it. You actually can see it when the ventricles repolarize. And repolarization is basically when the ions that were in the cell and outside the cell switch places and go back to the way they were so they can be ready for the next contraction. And when they do that movement and they go back to the way they were, there's going to be a little bit of electrical conduction, and that's what we see in repolarization. So just think of repolarization as what's happening to get ready for the next beat. So here we have the essential features of a EKG is the P wave, the Q R S complex, and finally the T wave. And this is essentially what you can see on any of these watches or devices that you might have when you personally take your own ECG. You should see a P wave, QRS, and a T wave. There is something that is known as atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a condition where not just one area 
of the atrium is going off, but in fact, all areas or many areas in the atria are going off at the same time. And as a result of that, instead of having a coordinated contraction that goes from the sinal atrial node down to the AV node and then around, you have all of these things going off all at the same time, and all of them are sending impulses and signals to the AV node. So instead of having a coordinated contraction from a single pacemaker, because the pacemaker is no longer coordinating all of that, you have basically what looks like a bag of worms where all of the different parts of the atrium are contracting on their own in a discoordinated fashion. The ventricles are still contracting appropriately, but instead of the atria contracting and pushing that blood that's here in the atria down into the ventricle, they're not pushing anything at all. And when I say that the atria are not pushing blood at all, of course, the blood is moving through the valves, the tricuspid valve in this case, but the atria themselves are not pushing that blood as a final kick into the right ventricle. In fact, the walls of the atria appear to be convulsing and not moving at all. There are two consequences to atrial fibrillation in that respect. And the first one is this, because there's no active contraction of the atria on both the left and the right side, there's no active pushing of that blood from the atria down into the ventricle right before the ventricle contracts. Now, there is some passive movement of blood through the tricuspid and mitral valves, but it's not that active, what we call atrial kick, right before ventricular contraction. And as a result of this, cardiac output goes down. This may be asymptomatic for some people. Other people might feel weak or fatigued, and they may have symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion. But to add insult to injury, the other real problem that we see in atrial fibrillation is that because there is stagnation of blood in the atrial area, sometimes what can happen is when blood is stagnant is you can get blood clots that form in the atrium. And so having blood clots in the atria is potentially a problem because those blood clots can break off and go to either the lung if it's on the right side or to the brain if it's on the left side. Of course, blood clots on the right side could also go to the brain if there was a hole between the right atrium and the left atrium, allowing those blood clots to pass through that hole and then also go to the brain. So these things can cause blood clots in the lung, and of course, blood clots in the brain can cause strokes. Now, it's not a very high risk. It's a few percent per year, depending on how old and how many risk factors somebody might have. But the longer atrial fibrillation goes on and the more it goes in and out of regular rhythm, how it's supposed to be, or what we call sinus rhythm, what it's supposed to be, going back and forth to atrial fibrillation, you can imagine if these walls are not moving and all of a sudden it goes back into its regular rhythm and starts contracting, these things could pop off very easily. And that's exactly what happens. So obviously, if somebody is in atrial fibrillation, you want to be able to pick that up as soon as possible. Because one of the things that we can do to prevent these blood clots from forming is to put these people on blood thinners. And blood thinners are known in the medical community as anticoagulants. And some of the blood thinners that people are on today, many years ago, we used to have them on Coumadin. And Coumadin is also known as Warfarin. And in fact, today, sometimes Coumadin is the best choice to put people on. But there are other medications that we can get into, for instance, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban. There's also Dabigatran. That's another medication that can be used. These are medications that are used more frequently now. In the hospital, sometimes we'll use heparin. So these are all blood thinners. And what they do is they prevent these blood clots from forming. If you can prevent these blood clots from forming, you can reduce strokes. And of course, the ultimate decision about whether or not somebody goes on anticoagulation, which has risks, is made between the physician and the patient, because a discussion between the risks and the benefits of anticoagulation needs to be had. So why would this be important in terms of ECG on these watches? Well, if these atria are not contracting, that means you will no longer have a P wave on your ECG. Not only that, the QRS complexes, instead of being very regular, they will be irregular. In other words, they won't come like clockwork. They'll be irregular. 
And here's an example of a lead one ECG. Here you can see that the R to R distance is a particular distance, and that distance usually is the same when someone is in normal sinus rhythm. And when I say the same, it's within a few milliseconds. So you're going to be generally about the same each time that the heart beats. You're going to have the same distance between the R wave and the next R wave. But it tends to vary in atrial fibrillation. Also notice that the P wave is very present here right before the QRS complex. Once again, showing that the patient is not in atrial fibrillation, but rather in normal sinus rhythm. And here's the type of ECG you might get. Again, lead one being on the watch. You can see here the QRS complex, these spikes, and right before it, to the left of it, you see these little P waves here. That again shows that there is normal sinus rhythm. Once again, on the top, we have a nice P wave, we have a QRS complex, and a T wave. A P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. Notice that the distance between the R waves are the same. Here, we have atrial fibrillation on the second tracing. Here we can see before these QRS complexes, we don't see a persistent P wave. Here, this looks like a sort of a wave, but if you notice that it's not the same elsewhere. And also, more importantly, notice that the distance between the R waves change as time goes on. Sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short. And again, we can see here in the drawing the SA node starting up here, and then it going across and then going to the AV node here. And the AV node holds things up, and then again it goes down the his Purkinje fibers, and then it allows for depolarization in the ventricles. Here's another example here at lead one. We see QRS complexes, but before them, we don't see P waves. And again, the distance between them is irregular. So because this is pretty simple to pick up, the intelligent or smart watches are able to analyze the data coming from the watch and be able to tell whether or not this is normal sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. And if it's atrial fibrillation, it's going to notify the person wearing the watch that they should get checked out and looked at because they are in atrial fibrillation. So I want you to remember that the watch has one lead on it out of 12 leads that are available on a regular ECG. And that is enough to be able to do the things that that ECG does. But you can get a lot more information from a 12-lead ECG. So the watch is not a replacement for the full ECG that you might have in a physician's office. But it is actually pretty good in terms of the information that you can get off of that one lead for, for instance, detecting atrial fibrillation like we showed here in this video. Speaking of a 12-lead ECG, though, we have a course on medcram.com designed and delivered for medical professionals. In fact, we give continuing medical education credits for those people that are interested in taking it and learning more about a 12-lead ECG and all of the aspects and diagnoses it can be helpful in. That being said, though, there have been non-medical professionals who have taken this course and have gotten a great benefit so if you are someone that is so inclined and wants to learn more about the ECG and the heart and the electrical conduction and rhythms and things that you could diagnose with a 12-lead ECG, come to medcram.com and sign up for this course. As you can see, we've gotten excellent reviews from hundreds and hundreds of participants. Our ECG course is also available at the Apple App Store. Here we go through in a systematic way how to interpret ECGs, and it's highly rated by physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, and more. There are also quizzes to test your knowledge along the way. Thanks for joining us.